okay, we are here. We're going to talk about measurement of photovoltaics. And uh, next week, uh, we can actually start looking at the commercialization part of it, something called the business model canvas. And I'll mention briefly at the end, uh, again, remind people again, but the most important thing here is that if, if you have the chance, please take a look at lecture zero and one uh, on Audacity. And it's here, so you can just click on it. And um, uh, you have to sign up, but it's free. And uh, if you have time, take a look at it. It's a course by Steve Plank on the lean startup. And it's actually the basis of what we will do for uh, this lecture. So it's actually a, a hands-on thing. So we're going to you know, work as, uh, in your team to, to, to make this canvas. Uh, then Thursday, actually, let me see. It's, oh, it's still loading. Uh, Thursday, we'll have the presentation, so I'll talk briefly about that. And then following week, we will have the lecture that was supposed to be on Tuesday. And then we follow the rest of the schedule. It's pushed back a little bit, but basically the same. Okay. Okay, so there are no other questions. Uh, not sure why this is not loading. Yeah, I'll check the link. Maybe there's some problem with it. Um, Okay, I'll try to fix that. Okay, so let's start with this. Okay, so uh, today's lecture, our goal is to understand a little bit. Uh, so you've learned about the fundamentals of solar cells, how to improve the performance of solar cells, and you will learn more about how to improve the efficiency of solar cells in some of the subsequent lectures. Today's goal is to uh, discuss what are the uh, details of how you actually characterize the solar cells. How do you measure them? And, and how do you decide, okay, what's a good cell, what's a bad cell? How do you, you know, do this properly? And it's a little bit complicated because of uh, you know, various reasons uh, that we'll talk about. So that's the, that's the over uh, view of the goal today. So, so the key parameters to measure for a solar cell we all know is the current versus voltage. Um, and the, essentially the solar cell is a reverse bias PN junction. And when light is incident on it, it uh, creates uh, essentially electron hole pairs that are free to move within the crystal lattice. And they move to the terminals and then form a current um, at a given voltage. So the bias voltage is the U. So you essentially apply a bias voltage and you measure what's the current flowing through the reverse bias junction. So this is a reverse bias, so the current is negative. So for those of you who know about solid state devices, this is just a um, um, formality, let's say. So as you increase this voltage, the current, because it's reverse biased, for a given uh, intensity of light. So of course, so first of all, I should mention this point here, is zero voltage and, uh, and you see some current flowing, okay? Zero voltage, of course, means you're short circuiting this device. So it's called ISC, referring to short circuit. Okay, so this current here is a short circuit current. Now, as you reverse bias the voltage even more, so you increase that voltage, your current starts to drop very slowly. And it's a nonlinear effect, of course. At some point, it drops fast and it goes to zero. So this position where the current goes to zero is called the open circuit voltage. And the current is zero, that means that the circuit is open, the switch is open, that means no current is flowing, and that voltage there is referred to as open circuit voltage, or UOC, OC for open circuit. Now this is a function, so these numbers here, ISC and UOC are very, very important for a solar cell. The UOC, as we will see later on, is actually a measure of the band gap of the device. And ISC is a measure, in a sense, of the intensity of the light incident on the device. Okay. Now, you can see, of course, this means that I can operate the solar cell at various bias voltages. So I can pick a voltage that's zero, and then I get short circuit current. Of course, that's useless because you're not producing any power. Power is, of course, current times voltage. So if the voltage is zero, the power is zero. So that's not useful. So it has to be somewhere between here. And here, of course, the current is zero. 
So again, the power is zero. So if you look at the power curve, it has to be something in between inside this curve, right? So let's say you pick a point here. And we have, we'll see in the next, next slide that there is an optimal working point, let's say it's somewhere here, which is where the power is maximized. And graphically, the way to think about it, it is the, your, the area under this curve is the work done by the solar cell or the power generated by the solar cell. And you're trying to maximize the area under this curve and that happens when this rectangle here fits perfectly inside this um, curve. Okay, so that's how you pick the optimal working point. Um, the area of this rectangle divided by the area of this outside rectangle is what's referred to as a fill factor, okay? So the outside rectangle here represents the ideal solar cell. In the ideal solar cell, the current should not change as you change the voltage. You should get the same current independent of the voltage up to an extent, and then you have this nonlinear drop to zero. So that's like the ideal solar cell. So the fill factor is a measure of how close to an ideal solar cell is the solar cell you're measuring, this FF. Mm -hmm. So just to summarize, the three parameters are most important to measure for a solar cell, and most people try to measure. The short circuit current density, or short circuit current, which is basically you take the solar cell and you short circuit it and figure out how much current is passing. The open circuit voltage, which is basically you open circuit the solar cell. In, a, in, in other words, you don't connect the terminals and you measure the voltage across the terminals. And then the fill factor, which is basically how close to an ideal performance is the solar cell. Three very, very important metrics to measure. Now, you can look at, so now I have flipped the current up. So it looks like that. It's the same curve as before. It's a current as a function of voltage, okay? So that's the open circuit voltage, that's the short circuit current. Now we can plot the power versus voltage. So this blue curve here is voltage times current, okay? So you take this red curve, so you have I versus V, and you multiply the I with the V, you get this blue curve. So this is P versus V, okay? And you can see this shows a peak value and then it goes down, right? And this peak value is our optimal operating point. That's the peak current uh, power that we can, one can hope to extract from the solar cell. And that determines the operating bias or voltage here. Okay, so this is the voltage at which you get the most power out, and that's the current in that situation. And that's called MP, maximum power, you know, either voltage or current. The fill factor, which we just saw before, is the area of this purple rectangle divided by the area of this light purple rectangle, okay? Which can also be written as IMP times BMP so divided by ISC times VOC. So this IMP times VMP is the peak power here, or this area of this rectangle here. Okay, this dark purple rectangle. And this ISC times VOC is the area of this light purple rectangle outside, right? This is VOC, this ISC. That's the area A divided by area. Okay, so that's the factor. The efficiency, which is of course the most important metric that we're trying to get to, is the output power, typically the maximum output power divided by the input power. Of course for the input, the output power, maximum output power is simply that, right, IMP times VMP. But input power depends upon uh, the lighting conditions. So it, 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 it can vary, but this is something you have to characterize separately. So the fill factor is uh, P max divided by VOC by SC, just like here. Okay. So this is the most important things to just keep in mind when you're measuring solar cells. Now, as I said before, the input power is very important in order to estimate the efficiency of the solar cell. And the input light intensity or light power can be de depend upon many, many conditions, whether you're using the actual sun for measurement, are you using a solar simulator, or is there clouds in the sky? If you're using a solar simulator, what kind of lamp is being used? So it can vary with many, 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 many different things. 
So in order to standardize this, the, there is this, uh, these standards have been defined. Okay, so we should just know what these are. Um, so, it, so the standards depend upon what application we're measuring for, whether it's for use on, on earth, like on top of your house, whether it's to be used with a concentrator, whether it's to be used on a spacecraft, or whether it's used at some other temperature on Earth, uh, which is different than the normal temperature, let's say room temperature. So for instance, for panels that are on top of your roof, uh, we typically use an intensity of about 1,000 watts per meter square as the input, because that's kind of the rough estimate of the intensity of sunlight on Earth. The spectrum is something we saw before in our early lectures. It's called the STM uh, Global. Uh, and the temperature is 25 degrees, typically. If you use concentration, of course, the intensity goes up much more than 1,000 because that's what concentration means. Um, the spectrum is typically the same, but this gets a little complicated because the spectrum can change with concentration. So this becomes a much more difficult uh, uh, efficiency measurement, which we'll talk about briefly. But uh, just keep in mind that measuring a, a solar cell under concentration the fish performance of the solar cell under concentration is a much more complicated thing to do than measuring a solar cell which is not, not under uh, concentrated. Uh, typically for concentrated cells, you go to a slightly higher temperature. For space applications, of course, the, we know that the spectrum is different. We call it AM0 because it's outside in space. You get a quite different uh, set of wavelengths. Uh, and the intensity you use is also a little bit higher. It can vary. It goes from something like 1353 to 1366 or 1372. So let's say about 13, 1400 uh, watts per meter square. Uh, the temperature is also a little bit higher just because the intensity is higher. Now, you can also have uh, these terrestrial solar cells at different temperatures. So it's called NOCT, it's the nominal operating cell temperature. So for instance, you can measure this at um, different temperatures, 20 degrees Celsius or not. So in this case, uh, it's a slightly lower intensity each on the watts per meter square. But these are coupled, of course. So it's just to show that you can have spe specific application specific standards as well. But the first three are mostly what uh, most people are concerned with. Okay, now. There are some very important uh, characteristics we should know about efficiency measurement, most importantly, area definition. So we all know that all companies like to claim that their solar cell is the most efficient and so on. So this is the reason why it's very, very critical for everyone to agree on how do you measure the efficiency. So yes, there are some standards to be followed, right? So area is one important uh, definition, how you measure the efficiency. What is the size of the cell and the size of the aperture you're using? Can you compute the input power. So for non-concentrated cells, this is relatively straightforward. You just use the entire area of the cell, and this includes area co covered by grids and contacts and so on, which might block the light, but that's part of the measurement because that's how you would actually use it on the top of your roof, right? You have to have those contacts and grids. Of course, uh, this means that you want to try to minimize the area covered by the grids and contacts, which might shadow the solar cell. So people try to put it in the back, like we talked about in the last lecture. For concentrated cells, of course, this is much more complicated because the area now has to be the collection area or the illumination area, which is the aperture. So where are you actually taking the food? Uh, thing from. So we have to be very, very careful how this is defined because it could be the input aperture of the CPC, for instance. Or if you're doing something else, it's, you know, it's, uh, it has to be defined very, very carefully. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that the input power um, has to be measured very, very carefully because if you don't have a good way to measure the input power, uh, then your efficiency measurements will not be consistent. So because of uh, reasons like this, there are, um, if you're a commercial producer of solar panels, you can go to a few centers around the world. There are three or four centers um, where you can ship your panel and have a certificate, which is, okay, this is the efficiency that was measured. And this is because you want to have a very, very careful calibrated measurement, particularly for the incident power. Um, so the, the, the center in the U.S. is in Colorado, the one based at the National Renewable Energy Labs. And there's one in Europe, one in Japan, I believe one in Australia. So 
So there's a few uh, different places that it can be done. In any case, the calibration uh, means that the incident power has to be calibrated very carefully. This is done using a reference cell whose uh, short circuit current has been calibrated with respect to a known reference spectrum. So uh, this is why you have to have a standard spectrum and a standard cell. Okay, so it's like a, essentially a definition of, of, of uh, efficiency. Um, of course, performance of solar cell depends on many other things, the location of the sun in the sky, which we have seen before. So for instance, uh, if the sun is uh, at sunrise or sunset versus sun is at the zenith, you change the amount of air through which the light propagates. And we know that it can change from air mass, what we call air mass 1.0, air mass 1.5. Uh, and this is, becomes air mass infinity, like, like we saw before, right? basically increases in this direction because you're going through more and more of the atmosphere. Uh, also because of the curvature of the Earth. So the relative air mass, uh, we've seen this before, is basically the ratio of the path length along the oblique trajectory to the path length in the zenith direction. So in other words, this is the distance in this direction, let's say in this location, divided by the distance in that direction. So this is 1.5 times longer. And this can also be defined as secant of theta. Theta is the angle measured from the normal. Okay? Theta is a function of time and location. Uh, of course, there are many, many possible uh, intensities at a given AM 1.5 uh, because it can be cloudy, it can have eclipse, uh, and it can have very large intensity because of concentrators and so on. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, of course, the spectra can also change, even though we say M1.5 in practice, it can change because of scattering from the clouds, pollution, uh, you know, all kinds of different things. So we have to be very, um, I would, in a sense, we have to always be very skeptical about any efficiency claim unless uh, the, per, the, the claim has been backed up with very, very careful documentation of how it was measured. So it's a, this is quite, quite, quite important. Of course, for, uh, for our purposes, if you want to do approximate efficiency measurements, that's perfectly fine as long as we are clear that these are approximate and we have to explain what approximations are. Okay. Uh, the next point I want to drive home is the importance of the spectrum. So the spectrum of light uh, used to measure the performance of a solar cell turns out to be extraordinarily important. Um, I know uh, we've been talking about this AM 1.5 spectrum as a standard, but we know uh, from experience, in fact, one of our earlier lectures, that if you shine uh, blue light as a solar cell or red light as a solar cell, I can expect a very, very different efficiency, right? And this is because it, the materials itself respond differently at different colors. So it's very, very important that we actually have a very clear definition of how will we characterize a solar cell. For, you know, what does it mean? Like, what is the spectrum you're using? Because a different spectrum can completely change the result. Uh, again, another reason why efficiency solar cells are very, very difficult to characterize and can only be done precisely at a few centers around the world. So the way people do this, uh, I mean, of course, there are approximate methods where you can try to estimate the efficiency, and this is one good example. So I'm giving you an example of how you can estimate it. So the, the expression is uh, relatively simple to understand. So in this example, we are looking at the short circuit current. So that's ISC referring to the short circuit current. This TR here refers to the test cell under a reference spectrum, okay? Which means that you have a test cell refers to the cell that you're, solar cell that you're trying to measure. Reference spectrum uh, corresponds to the spectrum that you uh, have um, a reference spectrum for. In other words, that's a known, very, very known, very carefully calibrated reference. Okay, so this is the short circuit current of an S test cell under a reference spectrum. That can be estimated by measuring the short circuit current density under a test source spectrum Okay, test cell under a source spectrum, which is something you have. So that's the source you have. That's the cell you have. You stick it under there and measure the short circuit current density. This is something you can measure. Times this factor here, which is the ratio of the short circuit current density of a reference cell under a reference spectrum. This is something that's known. 
you can look it up in a, in a book or something, or, or a table, divide it by something you can measure. So if you have a reference cell, this R reference, under the source that you have, the source spectrum, short circuit condensate. So you look this up in a table, you measure this, you divide that, it helps you to scale your measurement. Now, M is the measurement of the what's referred to as the spectral mismatch factor. We'll come to that in a second. But just to summarize, to estimate the short circuit current density of a cell that you're trying to measure under some reference spectrum, you can measure it under a source spectrum and scale it by this ratio of a reference cell under a reference spectrum divided by a reference cell under the source spectrum. Source spectrum refers to the source that you have access to. M is a spectral mismatch factor, which we'll talk about in a second. So again, what we are doing here is you have a setup, a solar simulator with a known source spectrum, and you have a reference cell that someone has characterized before and given you or you bought, and you have a test cell that you're trying to measure. So with the test cell you're trying to measure, you take a measurement, which is this thing right here. With the reference cell that you already have, you take this measurement, Okay, and this is something you look up in a table. And this is something you can calculate, as we'll see. And then with all these numbers, you can actually estimate, okay, my test cell will behave according to this under the reference spectrum, which is the standard. Okay, now what is the spectral mismatch factor? It is essentially the, a measurement of how different is the source spectrum from the reference spectrum. So the way you compute it is you basically take an integral over the, all the wavelengths of interest. In this case, you go from you know, UV all the way to the infrared of uh, this uh, product. So this is EFR basically is the <coughs> uh, reference spectrum of the source of a reference multiplied by the spectral response of the cell, of a reference cell. Okay, SR is the spectral response. This small um, subscript R is the reference cell, and you do this integral. So this integral here refers to what you would expect to, uh, uh, the current you would expect to obtain from a reference cell with the reference spectrum. Now you divide that by this integral, which is exactly the same as this, except now that you're doing it for the source spectrum which is the S, which is spectrum that you, the source that you have. You multiply the spectral response of the reference cell. So in other words, what happens when the reference cell is put under the spectrum of the source that you have. And then you have another ratio here, which is basically again the same thing, except now that you're doing it for the test cell. So this is the source spectrum, multiply the spectral response of the test cell, reference spectrum multiply the spectral response of the test cell. So essentially it's a way to correct for the spectral mismatch between the source spectrum that you have and the reference spectrum that you're supposed to report the efficiency for. So I know it sounds a little complicated, but the most important take home message here is I want you to remember that the spectrum of light used to do characterization of the solar cell is extremely important. Okay, now when we actually do measurements, we see all kinds of weird artifacts. So the next question is, how do you deal with that? So um, typically what you see are these current voltage artifacts um, uh, because of course you're measuring current voltage curves. One of the most common things is what you see is called hysteresis. And hysteresis uh, is basically means the following. So again, this is the voltage, bias voltage. This is the current in amps. Okay, this is our example for a crystalline silicon, C silicon solar cell. Uh, let's say you start at a voltage of zero, which is a short circuit, and you start increasing the voltage. Okay, the current stays flat for a while, then it starts going down as expected. Okay, so this is your normal curve. Okay, and let's say then you start decreasing the voltage again. Okay, so you decrease the voltage. Because of his terraces, it actually starts going back in this curve. It's a little bit different. So you see this different curve, and then it goes back here, okay? This difference between these two curves means that now you have some ambiguity about the performance of the solar cell, and this means it's his terraces, okay? There's some difference that happens. And this arises, could arise from many different um, 
possibilities, but a very common thing that happens is that charge carriers get trapped in uh, defects within the material in one direction, and they get freed in the other direction, so they slightly increase the current, uh, sorry, voltage in this case. Okay. Um, so this is something we have to be very careful about, and the solution is to reduce the rate at which this voltage bias is changed. In other words, you try to do this as slowly as possible, or measure the current at DC steady state fixed voltages. So you could consider just measuring voltage stop, you know, essentially stick a bias here, measure value, then very, very slowly move to the next one, measure value, and you allow the system to essentially die, um, reach a steady state before you do the measurement. Of course, in a manufacturing uh, situation, you can't afford to do that because you need to do these measurements super fast, right? So, but that's a big problem that we have, people have to deal with. Another very important problem, which is actually um, uh, very, very important for um, the most advanced solar cell materials today is so-called perovskites. In fact, there was a paper that came out about the, uh, dealing with this actually about a month ago. Uh, I'll explain that in a second, but let me explain what this means. The, uh, the phenomenon here is that the current voltage curves can change with exposure to light. So you can have these strange things where the solar cell performs uh, better after it has been sitting out in the sunlight for one couple of days. Like its efficiency can increase. Uh, and it was a big mystery for a long time. So, and, and, and after that, it can remain constant. So what people do during manufacturing is that you do what's called light soaking. So you stick this panel in a bath of light, essentially put it under a big lamp for a long time, typically for many, many hours until it reaches a steady state. So, so this is an example of how much change you can ex expect to see. So this is a CAD sulfide uh, copper indium disilinide cell. This is a common uh, tin film cell made by, for instance, uh, First Solar is a, uh, makes cells like this. Um, in, after initial exposure to light, you get an open circuit voltage of, let's say, 0 0.4023. After two hours and 40 minute exposure to light, the open circuit voltage has gone up 0.4103. Uh, short circuit current goes from 26.89, 26.88, not much change, but the fill factor actually improved slightly. So the efficiency actually increased a little, little bit. And you can come up with models to explain this and so on. But basically the way, the, the physics of why this happens is that if the char there are many charges that get trapped in imperfect semiconductors, defects, and light can um, sufficient, uh, you know, illumination for a long enough time can allow these charge carriers to essentially escape from these defects and then contribute to the current uh, that can be produced from these cells. Uh, this turns out to be a very important thing for perovskites and um, more, um, uh, I would say, sophisticated materials that are becoming very popular nowadays, at least in the research. So this is an example of how this is done. So this is a cell um, uh, which is placed under a big, uh, sorry, so this, is a, this is a big lamp and you can see a bunch of cells placed up here. This is basically soaking the light. So in this case, it's upside down. But this is an example from actually a company that uh, I visited a few years ago in, in California. Okay, the other thing, of course, we all know, for those of us who are electrical engineers are very familiar with this, the fact that contacts uh, add series resistance. So, you know, this is how a solar cell looks like. You have to solder in these contacts on. So these, of course, these contacts are never perfect. So you lose some energy here, and you have to be careful to be, um, you know, this cannot be avoided. So you have to be very careful when you do the measurements to model this properly so you can uh, extract the this effect of these contacts. Uh, a more sophisticated technique is what's referred to as four probe measurements, where you actually use multiple probes to, to measure um, the, these current voltage curves more carefully. Uh, but of course, these measurements are more complicated and much slower. So just something to be aware of as well. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the electrical measurements part of it. The next part of the lecture, I want to focus on the optics and the instrumentation used for the measurements, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? So when we do these measurements, typically, um, we have to, we can't uh, 
use the sun typically because uh, you know the sun changes it's not a standard right things can change over time so you want to use what's called a solar simulator in other words you need to build something where it looks like the sun and it has a reference spectrum that does not change so that's an example of uh, instrumentation oh but before i go into that let's talk a little bit about the instruments used for the electrical measurements it's just it should be pretty simple basically it's um, again a bias of a voltage and you measure the current right isc is short circuit voltage open circuit voltage voc p max the maximum power ADS efficiency ff fill factor squareness of the curve ff is p max over voc times isc so all of this you know already ADA the efficiency is p out over p in uh, or p max is p out and the denominator is simply the concentration factor times the area uh, sorry, C is the solar irradiance, which can include the concentration factor, but typically about 1366 watts per meter square. The area is the area of the cell, um, assuming there is no concentration. So you get a curve like that. Let's take a quick video um, to get a sense for a very simple way people have done this before, and maybe it'll give you some idea to measure, characterize the uh, systems in your project. So match six little play. Do solar power experimentation rig. It might look like a model boat, but uh, it's not. Let's have a look at what it's going to do. So this is the solar panel input side, and at the moment I've got um, a 2.1 millimeter connector there, going to yellow and black banana plugs, and then measuring the voltage across the solar panel is the first of these modules this is a voltage potential divider module and that feeds this stack of circuit boards here which is an arduino based microprocessor microcontroller um, the bottom board there is the arduino uno the board sandwiched in the middle is a sensor shield and the purpose of that is to plug in the various uh, sensor connectors and we'll have voltage sensors, current sensors and stuff like that. And then the top shield here is an LCD shield and that's going to be the display which will show voltage, current, power and other parameters of the solar panel. On the right hand side here we have uh, red and black connectors which will go to battery if we're charging a battery or it could be looped around like that uh, so that we can get um, the short, uh, short circuit on the uh, solar panel and measure the short circuit current and in the space here there will be a current measuring module but I haven't received it yet so I can't put it on another voltage measurement module to measure the battery voltage and eventually um, a DC to DC converter with modulation so that we'll try and do a little bit of um, DC to DC conversion thus try and get maximum power out of the solar panel. So here it is switched on you can see that it says solar panel DMM digital multimeter uh, although I can change that message later on and just one data field at the moment, which is the voltage measurement uh, data field, which will display the voltage coming from this sensor here, which is the potential divider sensor. So let's stick a solar panel on the input and see what we get. So I've balanced this solar panel precariously on top of and uh, wired it into the input plug. And we have 16.74 volts and we are indoors, so we're not going to get the full sort of volts that I get outdoors. Um, but that's the first stage of the solar panel experimentation rig, uh, measuring solar panel voltage. If I put my hand on the box, 16. And as I say, the next stage will be current, and then multiply the two numbers together to get power, and we'll just uh, build on it from there.
Okay, so in that case, you, you saw uh, he was essentially measuring the open circuit voltage. So basically, there's nothing connected to, so you're not drawing any current. So it's just the open circuit voltage. But that's the idea. The idea is that, you know, the potential divider that he has, he can essentially change the reverse bias of the PN junction on the solar panel and then measure how much current comes out. That's a very simple hack together uh, way to characterize your solar panel. So it's not hard, but you have to be careful about the loss mechanisms. Okay, so uh, the, the, the electrical part is not that complicated, but the optical part is a little more complicated. As I said before, the sun is not a reliable source, so people refer to something called a solar simulator. Now let's look at what it looks like. It looks typically like a big box like that, so it's an actual cutout of a solar simulator. So we start with a lamp, which produces the light, Typically, a xenon lamp is used. We'll look at a few other examples. Uh, there is typically a collimating reflective element, uh, typically an ellipsoidal reflector. Looks a, it looks like aluminum coated. Essentially, what it does, it takes the light and uh, redirects it like a flashlight, so it goes straight ahead, or as much of it as possible. Now, of course, uh, we know from thermodynamics, there is no way to actually collimate a, a lamp source like that. With, uh, without significant losses. But anyway, that's a different topic. Um, then there's a mirror here which uh, redirects the light, passes it through what's called an optical integrator, okay, which is typically a, a, an array of two little micro lenses or little lens arrays. And what it does is it homogenizes the beam. So if there are any non-uniformities in the beam here, they kind of clean it up and get a nice clean beam. Uh, and then there's a shutter, which you can use to turn on and off the beam. And there's a spectral correction filter. So this is basically a filter that ensures that the beam that passes through has uh, the spectrum that we want to use for measurement, as opposed to the lamp. So the lamp has a spectrum multiplied by this transmission spectrum of the filter. You get some spectrum that you can hope to use. There's another mirror which sends light down with some little bit of uh, deflection. And there is typically a collimating lens to um, simulate uh, direct sunlight. So the light comes straight down with very little angle. And then uh, you place your um, uh, solar cell in a working plane here. And then you have our, your electrical measurements. So this is the optical side of the measurement. This is the electrical side of the measurement. Okay. So it's uh, fairly complex. In fact, a solar simulator like this can cost you know, upwards of $5,000. Uh, very nice ones can cost maybe $50,000. So they, they vary in cost pretty significantly. Uh, of course, in my lab, we actually uh, go the cheap route and we build our own um, hack together solar cells, solar simulators as well for research. So various choices of lamps are available. This is from a company called Newport. Um, that's a very it's a common optics company. Uh, make all kinds of lamps. There are lamps, uh, it's a xenon lamp. Oh, I don't see the xenon. Okay, this is a tungsten halogen lamp. So this uh, 3300 Kelvin is just the temperature. So UTH refers to the tungsten halogen lamp. So that's kind of the overall spectrum. Once you use the filter, you get a filter spectrum which looks like that. This is the wavelength, of course, and this is the irradiance, watts per meter squared per nanometer. And this is the AM1 for comparison. So we are trying to essentially illuminate the solar cell with this dashed, uh, dot dashed line. Uh, and you can see that you know, with filters and lamps and so on, you cannot really approximate it perfectly, but you can get somewhat close enough to do some measurements. So we are kind of restricted. Uh, you can use what's called a mercury lamp, which allows you to get even shorter wavelengths. So this is the UV but it has all these spikes because it's mercury vapor. So we have atomic transitions, which give these very, very sharp spikes, which is actually typically not very good. Uh, but sometimes people use it to look at the infra UV part of the spectrum, the solar cells. Again, you, get, you have the AM1 for comparison. Here. So you can also have metal halide, halide lamps. Um, uh, these are less common nowadays, but typically they have a broader bandwidth compared to, let's say, a tungsten lamp, but it has all, all these spikes as well. So that's also an option. Again, the AM1 uh, spectrum is shown for comparison. 
So again, uh, just keep in mind that typically what people do is they use one of these uh, lamps and then use uh, spectral correction filters to get cl as close to the desired spectrum as possible. Now, there's another property of the solar cell that we haven't talked about, just referred to as the quantum efficiency. Now, quantum efficiency is actually in, um, quite an important property of solar cells, and it's something that depends very much on the color or energy of the photon that's incident on it. Okay. So what is quantum efficiency? It is defined as the ratio of the number of charge carriers collected by a solar cell Okay, that is the current, essentially. That's a current generated by the solar cell, because current is the number of charge carriers per unit time, divided by the number of photons of a given wavelength incident on the solar cell. So it is basically, if I send in a million photons at, let's say, a red wavelength, it is saying, okay, how many charge carriers will those million photons generate? Maybe let's say it generates 100,000 charge carriers. Then it's 100,000 divided by million is my quantum efficiency for that particular wavelength of red. Okay, so in other words, it is an indicator of how good is a solar cell at converting sunlight to electricity, which is of course the current. Okay, we don't worry about the voltage in this particular case. We are going to assume that we are working at the optimum voltage. Ideally, a solar cell should have high spectral response to the wavelengths where there is abundant number of photons in incident sunlight, which is of course in the visible. So typically you want to have a very, very high spectral response. In other words, lots and lots of current at the visible wavelengths for sunlight. Now, what does it look like? So quantum efficiency of a silicon, monocrystalline silicon solar cell, which is our most uh, ubiquitous solar cell, let's call it, and, and somewhat expensive, it's monocrystalline, looks like this. So you have wavelengths, this is what the plot looks like. So you have wavelength here going from 300 nanometers to infrared, 1100 nanometers, and quantum efficiency because it's efficient equals to zero to 100%. So typically you see the curve, which goes up, goes up, goes up. Of course it starts at zero because when wavelengths are very, very small, the, the, the most of that extra energy is essentially lost as heat. Not my, my, many carriers are generated. But as you start getting absorbed and carriers being generated, the current goes up. So this efficiency goes up, goes up, goes up, and then it flattens out, and then it starts going down, 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 down. Of course, beyond the band gap, nothing is absorbed, so you don't get any carriers. Okay, so there's a lot of physics involved in this, and people draw a lot of physical insight and conclusions from all these measurements. So let's talk about a few of these, so you have an intuition as to why these curves are important. So again, just remind ourselves, quantum efficiency is the ratio of the number of charge carriers collect, generated by a solar cell to the number of photons per given wavelengths in a solar cell. Again, that means that if I send in, let's say, 100 photons at 500 nanometers right here, I expect to create, let's say, 80 charge carriers. Okay, that's what that means. Now, so what is the physics? The quantum efficiencies reduce at short wavelengths due to surface recombination, which means that at very, very short wavelengths, the carriers that are generated have a lot of energy because, they have, because of the high energy of the photons, and they can very quickly get uh, trapped uh, and uh, undergo what's called a recombination event without uh, going to the terminals. Okay, basically, an electron in the hole can essentially annihilate each other because they have so much energy. So that's why this gets low. Uh, here, it's flat, but it's lower than the ideal 100% because you lose some energy because of reflection and transmission. And uh, in other words, be, you know, because of Fresnel reflections, some light is lost at the top of the solar cell. You know, some light passes through the solar cell, there's transmission losses, and there's some uh, recombination that happens because of what's called the low diffusion length. So you, you talked a little bit about it in the basics of solar cell, but the idea is that some of the um, charge carriers do not make it to the terminals of the solar cell, and they basically recombine and get lost. Um, so that accounts for this loss. And this decrease, of course, we know is because at long wavelengths, uh, there's less absorption. And then there's also losses because of rear surface passivation, reduced absorption, low diffusion loss. So just some defects uh, causing problems. 
And of course, quantum efficiency goes to zero for wavelengths longer than band gap. No, no, none of these photons are actually absorbed, as we know. And this is, of course, an ideal curve for an ideal solar cell, which, of, which you cannot achieve, but that's what people try to design their devices for. So how do you do this measurement? Uh, of course, this measurement is done by simply ascending uh, light at a given wavelength and measuring how much current is produced and then changing the wavelength and redoing those measurements. So it's a fairly complicated measurement. So let's just think about uh, a few of the conclusions on the data as well. Then all photons are converted and collected as charge carriers. Q is of course 100%. If the photons are with energy less than the band gap and absorbed, not absorbed, then the quantum efficiency is 0%. Quantum efficiency is generally reduced to, generally reduced to recombination. Blue, blue light is absorbed close to the front surface uh, because it's higher absorption. So recombination of the front surface will affect quantum efficiency at blue wavelengths. That's the top of the solar cell. Green light is absorbed mostly in the bulk of the solar cell. So low diffusion length to lower the quantum efficiency for green wavelengths, which means that the carriers will get recombined because of a smaller diffusion length. At redder wavelengths, which have lower energies, that they penetrate deeper into the solar cell, the recombination happens at the rear surface. Also, they suffer from lower diffusion length, just like the green light. So these are the main reasons, which is very similar to what we just talked about in the previous slide. Another, uh, another two concepts to keep in mind is something called external quantum efficiency, which includes the effect of optical losses, such as transmission through the cell and reflection away from the cell which means what happens outside the solar cell, so it's called external, or internal quantum efficiency, which refers to the efficiency after excluding the transmitter and selected light. So what happens inside the device itself? Only the absorbed light can generate charge carriers that in turn generate current. In, in general, when we do measurements, we always talk about external quantum efficiency, but if you want to understand the physics of the device, people typically look at the internal quantum efficiency. But if you're a practical manufacturer of solar cells, you almost always talk about external quantum efficiency. Okay, so the measurement itself uh, is um, wavelength dependent, as we know, because the band structure in a semiconductor uh, creates lambda dependent absorption. Photons with energy above the band gap is absorbed, and with energy below the band gap is not. An absorbed photon creates an electron hole pair, which if it reaches the electrodes, create current calculate quantum efficiency, we need to know the incident power in the cell and it's produced current at each wavelength. So currents produced by test cell and that by a calibrated photodetector are measured. The ratio of the cell current to the beam power is the cell responsivity. Okay. So basically what it means is that you have to measure quantum efficiency with respect to a reference cell, just like before. So it's explained in this expression, quantum efficiency is the number of charge carriers divided by the number of photons at a given wavelength, which is the current produced by the cell divided by the electronic charge. So that's the total number of carriers. And the bottom here is the input power of light divided by the energy of a, of a single photon that gives the total number of photons. So in general, sometimes this uh, power, for instance, is difficult to measure. So you use a reference detector where the, the, the responsivity is defined as the current divided by the input power. And then we rely on the linearity of this reference detector to change this equation as follows. So this P in is difficult to measure in general. So you use I reference divided by R to estimate this P in and then you get an expression like that. So this is just a way to say that if you don't have a way to I exactly measure the power, because that's a difficult thing to do without a calibrated detector, you can do this with the reference cell. So this is very, very commonly done in labs, for instance, we, we, we do this pretty, pretty common. Uh, of course, for that, you need to have a reference cell with a known responsivity. Um, the actual instrument used for quantum efficiency measurement looks something like this. Uh, there's the source, so you typically have a xenon light source. You have a filter wheel where you can select the wavelength. Uh, you have a chopper. This is for uh, phase locked loop uh, measurement because you're talking about measuring very small currents. You have a monochromator which picks out the wavelength. So it makes sure that the wavelength is just a single wavelength. Um, then you have a calibrated reference detector or a solar cell. The, the cell te under test is here, 
the amplifier, that, so the cell under test is measured or the reference is measured. So you can put either of these in the path. There's an amplifier to measure, to amplify the um, very small signals that are me uh, measured. And you have a lock-in amplifier to lock in to the frequency of this chopper that is used to chop the beam. So basically, the, it's like a pulse width modulation. You essentially turn on and off the beam with a very fast shutter here. And you try to lock the frequency of that shutter to the frequency of the very small current that you're measuring with this amplifier. So that's kind of a complicated setup, but just uh, it's, it's important to realize that typically when you do these measurements, the currents you measure are very, very, very small because you're measuring one wavelength at a time. Um, the goal is to provide a nearly monochromatic light source with a typical bandpass of one to 10 nanometers to enable over the whole wavelength range at risk the solar cell is active. Um, this is just another version of the Sternable light source. Um, just uh, not terribly important, but let's just quickly go through it. In this case, there are two lamps. So this is a tungsten halogen lamp, and this is a deuterium lamp, which allows you to get to shorter wavelengths if needed. And there's a mirror here which flips down. So if it's flipped up, you use the deuterium lamp. If it flips down, you use this lamp. Uh, and then everything else is basically the same. So you have some optics to clean up the beam. There's the chopper to, uh, to modulate the beam. Uh, there's a filter wheel to, to um, select certain wavelengths. Uh, and then there's uh, the micrometer driven slit assemblies to select the wavelengths as well. So these two things are used to essentially select the single wavelengths. Um, and then you have some um, setup here, which uh, is a, which is referred to as a monochromator. It's basically a mirror with some gratings. So this is a this is a concave mirror which focuses the light onto a grating, which disperses the light into different wavelengths. And then you have another lens which which focuses it onto this uh, fiber here, which is coupled into a fiber. Uh, and and this aperture here can be moved to select the wavelength very very precisely. So in a, you know, in a sense, this this setup here picks the wavelength in a coarse manner, whereas this more complicated setup here picks the wavelength in a very fine manner. So you get very precise control of the wavelength, and you get very precise single wavelength coming out of this fiber. So anyway, it's a it's a fairly complicated thing, and there's a lot of optics involved in how you design them. So just we should be aware of this. So monochromator has many design metrics. It's band pass, how, you know, what's the bandwidth of the light that's passing, the wavelength range, how much power can it actually handle. Uh, you can either have very, very narrow bandwidth, 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers, uh, which requires large focal length. So they tend to be very big, much bigger setups. Or you can have a wider bandwidth, 0.5 to 10 nanometers, which can have a short focal length, so much more compact. Uh, so there's a trade-off between the size uh, and the bandwidth, but there's also a trade-off between bandwidth and power because the narrow bandwidth requires a smaller slit size, which passes much less power. Wider bandwidth passes more power. So, uh, of course, more power means that you can do faster measurements. So when you do very, very precise bandwidth, very small numbers here, the measurements get to be very slow and complicated. Uh, of course, the wavelength range is needed uh, is uh, fixed by the requirement, which is sunlight typically. So you need um, several gradings typically for high efficiency. Um, you also need extra filters to cut, get rid of high diffraction orders from these gradings. Um, so basically this is saying that you need to be careful if you're trying to design a system to do these measurements. And it's, it's good to know what's inside the black box when you use these instruments. Uh, sources we saw before, it can be deuterium lamp, which is a UV lamp. Or it can be a quartz tungsten halogen, which goes from visible to IR. These two can be combined to cover the entire solar spectrum, as shown. They also have smooth spectrum, which is useful for QE measurements, so you don't have these very large uh, spikes. They also, you also want the beam to be very, very stable over time, so good temporal beam stability. Uh, but QTH lamps have short lifetimes, so they're expensive. You need to get replace them, especially for high power. Uh, on the other hand, xenon lamp has higher brightness and is smaller than QTH, but xenon spectrum is not smooth. So you have these big variations as, as you change the spectrum. Um, 
permissibility of xenon could be an, in, an issue, but there are control techniques to essentially deal with this by feedback. But so uh, again, we don't we don't need to go into huge detail here, but just you'll be aware that there's a lot of detail involved in how you build these systems to do uh, measurements for solar cells. Uh, one very important uh, optics challenge happens in the monochromator design, which we should be also aware of. Um, the idea is that uh, in a monochromator, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take the light from a source and assign it to a very small slit at a given wavelength. So you have to use multiple optics, like the geometrical optics that you have used, uh, studied in this class. You apply a condenser lens to essentially collect all the light and then a refocusing lens, which is typically a planar convex lens to focus light into the little slit here. So there's all these questions about, okay, how much loss happens in this process? You know, how much light can I collect? If I need to collect more light, I need a low F number for the condenser or a bigger condenser, I need to make it very big. But for a smaller image of the source of the monochromator and for larger F number of the condenser is desired. Uh, in other words, if I want to really have a very precise wavelength here, I need a smaller condenser. So those two are two opposing requirements with which I have to actually do some design trade-offs, particularly between the power that can be transmitted and the F number of the condenser. This is another important uh, metric here, which um, I will briefly mention is basically if you, what happens is you have a slit here through which the light then illuminates a grating. Okay, and by adjusting the acceptance angle of the light going into the slit, I can determine what the size of this grating is. And the larger the grating is, you get the more precise selection of the wavelength. So there's a lot of optics involved in how you design these systems to get the perf as precise wavelength selection as possible. Again, keep in mind the goal of monochromator is to select a very precise single wavelength. Okay, so one last thing to also keep in mind is the responsivity of the different solar cells. So in other words, how do different solar cells behave uh, under a different wavelength? So this is wavelength, this is the responsivity, amp current per watts as a function of wavelength. So this, let's see, where is the, so this is amorphous silicon curve. You can see the amorphous silicon response is right there. Alpha refers to amorphous. Uh, this is a uh, gallium arsenide curve right here. So you can see it behaves differently. It gives you better current and it's also red shifted because the band gap of gallium arsenide is, is uh, smaller than, well, the, because of the defects of the silicon. Uh, actually, band gap of gallium arsenide is actually larger, which is why you get this uh, response in the blue wavelength. And the uh, Copper Indian disulfide cad sulfide cell is in the dash curve, dash line right here. So it gives you the most uh, um, um, widest bandwidth, for instance. So that's why these things are also quite popular. And the solar radiation spectrum is shown in the background for reference. Okay, so that's kind of the last thing I wanted to discuss for today's lecture. So just to summarize very briefly what we talked about where uh, two aspects of measurement solar cells. One is the electrical part, like how you actually do the measurements, what are the things to watch out for. Number two is the optical part, which is basically refers to, you know, what are the things that you're measuring? How do you illuminate the solar cell? If you're measuring quantum efficiency, how do you get the different wavelengths and so on? So, and uh, the spectrum. So I, I went through a bunch of things here fairly fast. So. My recommendation is please go back and read through it fairly carefully. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, things might seem a little unclear, you know, feel free to let me know and I, I can clarify it. Okay, so I just, last thing is I just wanna make a quick point about presentation next uh, Thursday. So actually, before I go on, are there any questions? No? Okay, I, I don't hear anything, so I assume not. So for, for the second presentation, which is next Thursday, the 
key goal is to make a technical case for innovation. So really uh, rely on your assignment four to make this case because you would have done all this analysis. You need to address the following. Uh, show simulations or calculations. Uh, basically explain why, how your system works, why your system works well. Show measurements or videos and prototype or mock up with detailed drawings. If you haven't built anything, that's okay. So you can bring your prototype if you, if you uh, have it, if not, show a video. You, can per, you should perform a very simple cost benefit analysis. In other words, okay, how much do these things cost in return for what is the reason for a particular um, item in your system? You know, what benefit does it provide? Uh, in each case above, you have to be very clear about what assumptions are being used. Okay, and uh, that's my last slide. So I'll stop here and see if there are any questions. And 